Jinping, I have a question for you. Um, I um, understand that Uber rates not only the driver, but they rate the, the passenger. Yes. So does Didi do the same thing? And what, what does uh, Didi do with that data? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good question. Uh, so so we uh, actually we do both ways, right? So the passenger will rate driver, driver will rate passenger. So now we finish the first part. So the, the system already online, the, the, uh, the score for the, for the drivers. It's interesting actually if you go online, if you, if you read the Chinese, uh, now most drivers uh, are actually very, actually pay close attention to that score. So they will try their best to actually make sure that score is high. And now, just about one month ago, we do the other way, right? We, we try to also compute the score for the, for the drivers, of no, for the passengers. passengers. And these will be online, I think, in one month, about, yeah. So these are similar, symmetric problems. Right. Yeah. And, and what is, what utility is the passenger score? Hmm? What is the utility of the passenger score? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so that's, a, uh, still, I think, quite open, but there are two things we are thinking about. First one is, uh, if you call, if you call a service, something, something is going wrong with your, you know, let's say your request. Then if your score is much higher, then you will be received much quickly, probably, mm. right? And the other, the other application is like, if two passenger, uh, the same, I mean, just the ideal case, right? If two passenger, they ask for a request, and they are, uh, there's only one driver, equal distance then the passenger with higher score may likely get the, get more the likely get the yeah, yeah. answer, basically. But this is still open. Right? We are at least quite open. So we are, we are trying to actually uh, to make sure the, our model is accurate. Because if the model is not accurate, it's a big issue. Right? So we are working very hard. You have a lot of angry customers. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Good. I see we have a question here. From oh, hi. Um, We've been hearing about connected automated vehicles, uh, you know, at this conference, and it's in the it's in hypes in the water. I mean, you know, so just I wonder from each of your perspectives uh, what you're thinking about, you know. So, Ji Ping, you know, is this something that's going to happen to Didi and Carol? What's the effect of this on uh, safety data and thinking about the future? And Pascal, just in terms of your thinking in terms of these systems, how does that play? That's my question. Yeah. Uh, so. Actually, all of the vehicles in DD are, in some sense, they are connected, right? Because they are all connected to our, our platform, our APP. Uh, so one area, two areas we are thinking about uh, is, first one is the security, okay? Uh, and the second one, I think security is now the, maybe one of the major issues. And I think the connectivity uh, may actually help. But at least something maybe will be in the future, not 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 in a current system. Maybe. Right. So we, um, you know, we hear a lot in this country about Uber. You know, get, really, you know, it's in the paper every day that they're thinking about replacing the drivers. Is that something that DD's thinking about? I mean, I've been to Beijing a couple of times, even sitting at the Kentucky Fried Chicken with you a couple of times. You know, uh, you know, there's a lot of traffic there. It'd be hard to imagine. So that's a very Sensitive issue, actually. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, okay. So I think DD play. Uh, I think plays very close attention to uh, these technologies. Uh, all I can tell is, I think DD. I think it is uh, one of the best platform to get to get data, right? And uh, to actually provide the uh, like the training for these models, and right. also to commercialize these technologies. Right. So these are one of the, I think, the ideal uh, platform for such techn technologies. Yeah. But it is quite open, uh, also for collaboration in these areas. I think. Yeah. Cool. So Thanks. that's all I can tell. Yeah. Carol. Yeah. See if I can. Is that working? Yeah, it's working <coughs> okay. good. Um, yeah. So what? Umtree's worked a lot in automated and connected vehicle, and I think the, my main comment on that is automation is actually quite a bit farther along than connectivity, yeah. uh, realistically. And so the data that we have, which are vastly richer than, than message data, interestingly, sort of serve a model of, you know, they, they 
it's an opportunity to kind of figure out what we wish we could know, what needs to be communicated, and then at the same time we actually have communication data where you can, I mean, you can kind of work it both ways. You can say the, the messages that go out are actually quite limited. So can we achieve what we want to achieve through communication? You can do that in simulation. Um, similarly, can we imagine what else needs to be communicated through that? So there's a lot of work in just setting up the systems and the, um, which is kind of outside of my areas, you know, what, what are the protocols? How do you deal with cybersecurity? All very important questions. Right. But, but a key question is, what are we actually trying to communicate in, in that system? I think that's actually one of the most important potential uses of data that we have uh, here. Thank you. Very good question and a very sensitive question, obviously. Uh, I think the way I view this is that typically people have a certain budget and uh, they do the best they can with that budget. If, the, if automated cars are coming, uh, they will relieve some of the budget pressure. And then you can use that budget for actually improving the service and connecting communities which are not connected at this point and uh, offering uh, services that are not available uh, to for, for various purposes, including schools, including, uh, including medical services, and including you know, connecting jobs and people. So I think for me, I think there, is a, there, there are sensitivities, but there are also a lot of opportunities. You see entire communities in, in Detroit, for instance, uh, which are completely not deserved by the, by the, by the public transportation system. If you, they don't have the budget, if you get automated cars, these communities would have a lot, you know, a, a lot a lot better access to the jobs and to, uh, the kids you know, won't have to change four buses to get to school and things like this. So for me, it's an opportunity in many cases. Uh, obviously, you are gonna display some of the drivers, but I think the jobs and the connectivity to jobs that you're gonna have, offer to people uh, are, gonna be, are gonna be substantial. In Detroit, they, you know, they rework some of the bus lines and then people were not, you know, they lost their job. They couldn't keep their jobs that they had because they were not connected to the jobs anymore. So I think I view that as an opportunity to actually change completely the, demo, the, you know, the social mobility of, of entire segments of the population. So for me, they, they, they can make a big difference. Super, Thank, thanks a lot, that's a good, good discussion. Uni? I have two questions. I'll ask them up front because those are two, two different peoples. Uh, so, Carol, you talk mostly about safety or you have worked a lot on safety. I did not hear the other two guys talk anything about safety. Can you critique them and, and put some sense into them about safety? And, and, and number two, Ji Peng, you work on issues much larger than Ann Arbor. Okay, they have now a good-hearted effort here in Ann Arbor. I don't know how, what part of your time you spend in Ann Arbor. Can you critique the Ann Arbor effort or, or tell them about lessons learned from a much larger effort where you genuinely use machine learning? Um, and I can co not critique anyone? Yeah, you can critique <laughs> both of them at nauseam. <laughs> okay. I think the safety question is actually for you guys. Safety is good. <laughs> so, I mean, I think, I think you asked the question, what are they, where does safety come in to what they're doing? And, and I, I'm sure that they can answer that. It's... I mean, our goal is essentially to remove cars from, uh, from, from the inner cities and to replace them by a, a, a transit system which is much more effective, much safer, and if you replace them by automated car at some point, and these are gonna be safer than human drivers in general as well. So I think safety is very much a side effect of what we would be doing. Uh, so everything that Carol is doing for improving safety will directly benefit what we, what we will be doing. Actually, safety is a, a major concern in DD. So there's a lot of work actually on, uh, on safety. But right now, up to now, there's actually no big data, no AI. No automation actually was involved in uh, safety issues. Uh, but I think uh, recently there have been a lot of uh, discussion how we can actually make use of big data right? uh, to actually help safety. Actually, like even yesterday, actually, I talked to uh, Henry. We, will set, we set up a meeting tomorrow actually to discuss the safety issues. Right? So the, 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 the difference will be how we can use big data to make a difference for safety. Right now, it's all Manual, actually. Manual operation, manual inspection. Uh, we try to make a difference. You're also supposed to attack. Question. 
<laughs> uh, hi, Sean Ma. Oh, okay. So From, he's he's oh, supposed sorry. to attack me. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, although DD is the, the market, the, it's much larger, like China, right? Uh, but the most operations actually operate on each city individually. So it's not much larger, actually. We just, uh, it's the uh, it's, uh, aggregation of all the data from all the cities. Like Beijing and Shanghai, they will not be, when we do a, a dispatch or ETA, they will not be actually do it done together. It's sep all separate, right? Uh, but one key uh, difference between China and the US and other is traffic, because the, the, the the traffic, the traffic situation in China, it's much more dynamic, much harder, much more heterogeneous. So it's, if you can do well in China, you can do much, I mean, in terms of driving, like driving, right? If you can do drive well in China, you can do easily here, right? So the, the, the problem we deal with in China is much more challenging like, in terms of the traffic. So many of the, but I do believe many of the technique uh, from here can be adapted to actually solve the same issues, issues in China. So the technology will be shared, but the problem is just more challenging in China. So, so let me take that because I think that was a very good question. So, uh, so the way we, the, so, so Ann Arbor is a very dense city. So there are a lot of people and a lot of riders in one particular position, and on, on two or three miles, uh, you know, kind of four by four miles, uh, square miles, you have a lot of ridership. So what, what we do is essentially we we also dis, you know do distributed optimization. So we don't we don't actually optimize the north campus with this you know at the well we optimize the various parts of the campus independently. That's the only way we can do this because essentially we get a request every three seconds. Okay. So if you you, you will always do things by uh, geographic geographic in a geographic in a distributed geographic manner. Otherwise these systems will never scale. So in a sense what Anambor is giving you is a, is a real set for actually testing many of these IDs because you have a very intense ridership and you have um, you also have the, exactly the same issue if you have a request every three seconds it's it's not easy to optimize I can tell you that now the other things that you have here is that you have a transit system if you try to do DD or Uber or Lyft here uh, you would have to increase the size of Fuller Road by a factor of 10 okay the congestion would be so bad that uh, nobody would be able to travel and so one of the big issue, one of the big things that we are dealing with is making sure that Ann Arbor is remaining a livable city so that we don't have, you know, major traffic jam because we have on-demand transportation. On-demand transportation and, tra and, 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 and traffic jams don't go very well together. So we are avoiding that and I think that's a model for other cities as well. And I'm sure, you know, we could apply some of these ideas in China, although I completely agree that China is much more complicated because uh, the traffic jams there are, are very substantial and the number of people and the density is, is huge. Uh, but it's, it's a very interesting issue to deal with. But we have a micro, you know, a, a kind of a micro system here where we can test these issues. Yes, question? Yes, so um, from one of our online viewers, uh, Michael Conlon, he would like to direct a question to Yu Yiping. He would like to know uh, how he can follow up to learn more about the cluster that you were describing that uh, DD has put in place that potentially allows collaborators to work with DD mm -hmm. given the restrictions that you have. Mm -hmm. So basically the question is, how can Michael follow up with, with you to explore opportunities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I will actually be here tomorrow and Friday. I will meet with a bunch of people. Uh, so if uh, you are interested, so you can just uh, I think uh, Henry is actually in charge of my the schedule, so we can talk to Henry Liu. He's not here, or even my Brian or L. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Henry can help. Yeah. Or you can just send me to uh, my my email. Like uh, you, all right. My you miss email will work. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And then the system is already running actually, right now. Uh, so. Yeah, we, we, we want the UN to be the first to actually want to try, actually. Great. Mm -hmm. Another question. Yes. Uh, Sean Long from Psychiatry. Uh, this actually is another question for uh, Jay Ping. Um, so I just learned that DD also has the taxi under your fleet uh, in operation. But um, how do you, when you um, started this service, how did you um, convince the taxi drivers that's not um, taking away their jobs or, uh, like, 
were there tensions like what we see here in the United States with Uber? Local government, taxi drivers are, you know, angry that Uber is taking away, you know, all these uh, job opportunities and not regulated. So mm -hmm. how did you um, ease mm -hmm. that tension and mm -hmm. incorporate them, convince them to come down mm -hmm. into uh, your, your fleet? Mm -hmm. uh, another question maybe someone has asked already. Uber also is starting a driverless uh, ride fleet in uh, Pittsburgh, I believe. Mm -hmm. Is that under Didi's um, future map that you, mm -hmm. it will dispatch auto driver yeah. technology? Thank you. It's a very good question. Uh, for the second question, uh, so as actually Brian already already asked, right? so DD is actually uh, I think pay close attention to uh, to these technologies because uh, we know Uber is running a lot of I think uh, uh, experiments in Pittsburgh and also in San Francisco, right? uh, but in China the situation is much more complicated. It will, it will take a much longer time to make this work, to commercialize, I think. So, so Didi has more, uh, I think, time to actually think about this. You know, unlike Uber, it's competing maybe with Google, Tesla, firstly. I think they are, all of these are actually maybe near completion to make this actually work, commercialize, right? Uh, so, but, but as I mentioned earlier, Didi is actually think, uh, Didi is now working with a few companies to help them develop such technology, like collecting data, stuff, right? So, so, so uh, we are basically part of this uh, team so working on that. For the first question, you talk about what? Taxi, Taxi right? Yeah, uh, there's always the tension. It's the same, similar situation in DD and in Uber. But there's a key difference is, one of the key differences is uh, DD starts with a taxi, actually, if you see the my figure, right? So in 2012, uh, Didi only has taxi. And for the first three years, there's uh, no private car, just all taxis. So you can, as you can see, Didi and the taxi has uh, uh, this uh, close connection, right? And later on, I think since 2014, late 2014, we have uh, private cars, express cars, then there's a tension, there's a competition. Uh, but since Didi starts with, with a taxi, uh, so Didi pay very close attention. Uh, so Uber said, right? Uber said, Uber tried to kill taxi, if you can, you know, try to kill taxi. But DD said, we try to work together. That's our goal. So for example, my, one of my project is to integrate uh, taxi and uh, this uh, express car together in a system. But it's not easy, right? But that's something we are trying very hard to make sure they are not uh, competing. But we try to make sure they can work together. Right? I think that's a key difference, the origin. Uh, we started from the taxi. So we try not, we will not kill taxi, we try to work together. Yeah. Another question? <laughs> yeah, I had a question, um, and I, I think it's more for, uh, yeah, I have a question related to uh, pricing. One of the issues with congestion is that there is a limited amount of capacity and everyone's making a private decision about the cost of the trip related to how long it takes and uh, any other costs plus the, you know, the value of the flexibility with the vehicle. So we've been talking here about a lot of technical solutions without actually looking at saying we have a misallocation problem that's very, very fundamental here. And um, I'd like to have, the, have you all talk about some of how this might make some of these technical solutions much more efficient, or in some cases not even necessary if we had proper pricing for uh, road capacity or parking. Stop? Yeah. Oh, okay, 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 I can stop. Uh, so I didn't mention pricing here, but pricing now actually is not a uh, top, one of the top issues uh, we are actually working on right now, DD. I think right now the top one is carpooling, top two is actually pricing. Uh, we actually hire an uh, economic professor from the U.S. to help us work on the pricing issue. Okay. Uh, for the first four, four years, uh, so the DD pricing is very naive, actually. So what do we do is, like, for each city, we know the price for the taxi. Right? Then we will uh, actually estimate the price based on taxi. Taxi, taxi $20, then we will do, a, let's say, maybe 80%. Express, right? So it's a very simple idea. Just make sure it's like 
difference between taxi and uh, all, all other services, right? So the Express is cheaper than taxi, and a private car, luxury car, more expensive. So that's how we do pricing. But we find out now is that's not very efficient. So that's why I think starting a few months ago, uh, we hire uh, a domain expert professor in this area to actually to again use our big data, our big data, and then they use the, their theory from economics uh, to actually uh, do pricing. And we know Uber has a lot of uh, actually experts like professors working on the pricing, but that's not the case in DD. Yeah. And we try to catch up. My yeah. question is really not related to the pricing within the, the transportation links you're talking about. It's the fact that there is limited road capacity, and you have people who are not internalizing the externality of the fact that their being on the road and driving slows everybody else down. And the linkages that you're, that you're speaking about, mm -hmm. uh, Pascal, really require, in some sense, they're working on the same infrastructure, and you know how do you get the high-value trips to happen, and incentivize people with lower-value trips not to drive? Yeah. So, so let me answer your question because uh, part of the project uh, we have an incentive design group, and that's where we spend also a lot of time thinking about these issues. Because as soon as you add this on-demand component, uh, you also may increase the demand on the you know the transportation system significantly. So we have to take that into account. So, the, for instance, you know, one of the things that we are afraid is that all the students on North Campus are going to decide to go elsewhere to actually have lunch because, no, you can have uh, interesting on-demand rides and they're going to be efficient. So the way we think about this is um, also, uh, uh, so before I address your question, there, I think you have to understand that there is a huge difference between a transit system and uh, solutions like DD or Uber or Lyft. And I think there is a tremendous value in actually combining these two. A trip with Lyft or Uber to the airport is 30 bucks at this point, uh, to going from here to, to uh, uh, the D Detroit airport. Uh, a trip with taxi is about $50. Uh, uh, we can have a service which runs much more efficient if people can car share. And so that's the kind of things that we are trying to do also. So it's, uh, there is a huge difference between the price of a transit system and the price of a particular, uh, you know, of, of services like Uber and EDD. They have decreased the price, but not at a, not at a level at which, you know, uh, underprivileged, you know, population can actually access it. Now, to answer your question, what we are thinking of is actually a, a big thing of what we are thinking of is how can we shift the demand a little bit such that you relieve pressure on the actual transportation system? And, you know, uh, what we want to avoid is what happened in Stockholm in Sweden, where they actually, you know, put a pricing mechanism for on certain roads and so on. And only rich people know can go by car to the city. And I hate that. I think this is not socially responsible. So what we are trying to do is, you know, uh, to do the opposite. If you are willing not to travel during those times, you're going to get some incentive. You're going to get free rides at other, par other, other part of the day and things like this. That's the way we are thinking about this. There were some experiments in Stanford doing very similar things. So I think we are thinking you are reversing the, the attitude. Can you shift the demand uh, by encouraging, you know, can you encourage some behavior that are going to be socially uh, optimal, from a, you know, optimal from a welfare standpoint? And that's what we are looking at. So it's not a pricing. It's actually doing incentive and trying to see, you know, whether else, and also a big thing of what we are doing is trying to reduce the number of cars on the roads as well, right? So that should relieve some of the pressures as well. So I'm not sure I'm completely answered the question because this is a topic that we spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, but we are building the infrastructure to be able to address these issues and actually see in practice how people are going to react to these things. So it's very difficult to understand how people react to this mechanism. And I can tell you that a lot of people are, you know, uh, gaming the system for Uber and Lyft at this point. They understand how the system works and they are gaming it in various ways. And so we want to have a system which is actually robust against manipulations and things like this. So that's the kind of things that we are thinking in our group. And there is a, a couple of uh, people actually thinking hard about how to do this in the context of this project, but also uh, car sharing in general. So it's a great question. Henry? Yeah, I guess sort of following up on that other question is uh, obviously one way to do, to reverse the Swedish uh, example is to say you give preferential access to multi-passenger vehicles so that they have access. And I was just wondering, I would like to hear from Pascal, but also is China, you know, Shanghai I think had a, 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 a fees for entering the city, but that is China considering options for how you can dispatch the guideways so that you can encourage 
multi-passenger vehicles. And I, I was noticing in one of your slides, it seemed that Didi actually owns buses. At least there was a picture of a bus up there. I, 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 are you thinking about, uh, obviously if you're gonna decrease congestion, you've either gotta short, shorten uh, following distances, which is tough in a city. You eliminate people looking for parking, those help. But ultimately you need to get more people in each car or shift people away from rush hour. So I, in this, this is a design space that I, I would think that China must be thinking about. Um, so, so Andrew, I, I think it's a fantastic question. I am, typically, I have slides on these things, but uh, we had only 25 minutes. So, I think we view also the uh, we view also the infrastructure as a big part of what we are trying to do and exploit the fact that we could inform the infrastructure. We could have you know priority signals for buses. We could have dedicated lanes uh, for vehicles with higher capacity. This is happening in some cities, you know, but it, it, you know, uh, in in the U.S. I also think that, uh, yeah, so I think, I think really we see that as a collaboration between the mobility, you know, typically we view these things in layers. We have a mobility layers and we have an infrastructure layers and they have to play hand in hand. Uh, it's, it, yeah, absolutely. So I think this is, this is going to be a big part of the solution. So even in, Bos in Boston, I lived a, you know, a long time on the East Coast. You, you, you go to Boston, you have five or four or five lanes with people and they are, you know, they move, they commute to Boston. They are single, you know, one car, one person. And then you have the priority lane for more than two people, uh, which is getting jammed because there are not enough lanes for this. So if you could reverse the situation, it would be very, very different. So I'm, I truly believe in that. I think it's a very nice collaboration between pu public and, and, and private and mo different mobility layers. So I think there is great opportunities to do that. Once again, social acceptance is, a, is, is important uh, and understanding how people react to these things uh, is a basic open issue. But I agree that this is something that you should be doing, we should be doing. <coughs> yeah. So DD does have a bus, bus service. Okay. Uh, so we have a like big bus for 20 or 40 people. We also have like a sh like smaller one, like for seven people. Okay. Uh, but it's not uh, like very effective. The, the, I think one of the reasons is like in China, the bus system is very 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 strong actually, owned by the government. Uh, so many buses moving along, so it's not easy to. Uh, to compete with the government, right? But we do have the bus service and it's running and, and uh, we also focus on the, uh, the last mile issue, as the Pastor also mentioned, okay? So people actually use the metro, use the bus, and from the bus stop, metro stop, to their home, it's still one mile, okay? And it's, it's less efficient to actually get uh, like the express car. So in this case, we try to use a small shuttle bus, like seven people, from uh, metro stop, to your home, you know, to a neighborhood, basically. Right? So in this case, these were well, actually quite effective. Yeah. Another uh, question. You guys said you touched on, uh, mine is a uh, I work in town. Um, I think you guys touched on this a little bit, but I'm curious, like, I, I assume there are situations, uh, for example, where uh, indeed you have, you have a, a, such a significant number of cars on the street that where you direct them will affect the traffic outcome that you could cause congestion by directing a lot of traffic in a certain way. Um, so I'm curious uh, if you guys do any work to try to forecast the effect that you will have on traffic and like in other transit scenarios, how, like, how that would interact with other kind of solutions to deal with congestion and, and other kind of like central traffic control type of problems like that. Uh, okay. So first, there's actually uh, there are a few studies uh, in terms of like whether whether DD actually uh, make the traffic worse or not, right? So there are a lot of studies, uh, and uh, I think a majority of the study shows actually it's not. So DD does not make the traffic worse uh, because in China, if you like in Beijing, unlike in US, it's easy to, to buy a car to get a plate. In actually, in China, it's not easy. It's not easy to own a car, basically, right? Uh, people yeah. will spend like a few years, four years, to get a license plate, actually. Yeah. Right? Big money. Yeah. So, uh, okay. You know you, you, you know, you guys were getting there, and it was because of Henry's question, but I wonder if we could be just a tad more specific about the relationship between the work you're doing in smart cities, you know, and what, and then maybe what the standards are in the middle that would enhance you know, our big data efforts in transportation, uh, you know, what's the roadmap going forward there? Because it hasn't really been clear. 
to start? Um, yeah, that's a great question because smart cities are sort of the extension of the kind of, well, I, I think of transportation as kind of central to, to most problems and that's probably not completely reasonable, but from a data perspective, smart cities, the whole point of being smart is that you've got information and information integration then is, you know, so, so single source information, which is really how our information systems work, right? They've been developed for the purpose that they were developed for, typically administrative. And so the whole idea is not only that the cities have extra sensors compared to what we have now, so sensors on vehicles, communication, but that in fact information is combinable, integratable, and, and that we can actually do that in real time. And so the work that, you know, in my project is fairly straightforward mapping, which is that the data integration as well as the sort of access to answer questions is essential to a smart city data system. And I kind of limit myself to transportation, but when you start thinking about where transportation goes, it goes everywhere. It, it touch, I mean, Pascal actually does a great job of, of making that point, uh, which is that, you know, jobs, transportation, health, transportation. Um, and so, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it'd be really great to kind of have those linkages spread out even to the, um, you know, think about sort of transportation to healthcare as a as a simple example. How, how do we how do we deal with that network? Might you be able to incentivize in, in, to priorities for say job travel and healthcare travel because there's essential travel and non-essential travel, and you know that it clearly is an integrated data problem. So I think it's a fantastic question, Brian. And, and so 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 we have, we have I think that we have two. So I had a chance to, to talk to two groups. The first one is people here at the university in urban planning in social science, in the medical school and so on. And they give you a very interesting perspective on mobility and, and the medical school and social science in general and urban planning. And then we have the opportunity to talk with a lot of cities. And mostly people are gonna say, it starts with mobility as, as Carol just said. If you have that, you solve a huge amount of problems. And so when you talk about smart cities for me, it's you know, can we get enough information so that we actually, we actually can design the mobility services such that they meet the demands of the population, they meet the needs of the populations. And so, in a sense, what is exciting about the Annabo project is that we have massive amount of data of what people are doing here. And therefore, we know we can actually design a system which is optimal, optimized for the city. Now, many cities don't have that. They don't know where people are looking for jobs. They don't know where the jobs are. They don't necessarily know where the supermarkets are. And every time we go and talk to a city, the first thing that we do is an understanding, you know, where are the jobs? Where are the people going to these jobs? How do you connect these people to the jobs? How do you connect? Where are the hospitals? Where are the supermarkets? So for me, everything in smart city is about getting the information such that we can do better system, better mobility system, better service, and it's always gonna be mobility and something, as Carol just said. And I think for me, all this smart city initiative is about collecting data such that you can make big decisions like the one that we are dealing with. And the big difference between an arbor and some of these cities is just the kind of information that we, that we have or don't have. Okay, so I, I have to uh, ask a follow-up on this, and that is getting back to Carol's superb point of, uh, we're getting data from people who have access to high-tech equipment. There's a brilliant book that's just out called Weapons of Map Destruction, and this is sort of the, a classic transportation example of that. If we're only providing services to people from whom we can gather data, we may not be providing uh, the services that Pascal is just talking about. But even worse, uh, if you look at travel patterns even of low-income people, what you're missing are the trips that weren't taken. Uh, the, uh, Pascal described the trips that didn't go to the job or didn't go to the supermarket. Uh, and so I don't know, how do you, if you're gonna take Pascal's vision, you need data on non-taken trips, and I don't know how you uh, use technology to do that. So I would actually argue that the whole conversation about survey versus convenient sampling and sensor-based data is, it goes right back to the question that you're asking. So this morning there was a lot of discussion about, you know, the, the survey is not dead. And this is exactly the reason is that the smart city is smart for people who are themselves kind of connected into it. 
um, but you have, to, you have to actually go out and ask people. And, and our travel surveys, interestingly, typically focus on where people did travel, but they need to also ask the question, where did they want to travel? Um, and there's actually some work, uh, there's a faculty member in sociology who's last name is escaping me and I'll, I'll work it out, who's, who's interested in sort of uh, the, um, uh, was it, it's, um, sorry, I'm losing the word, but, the, but it's analogous to sort of food, the food desert question. You know, do you have access to food? Do you have access to transportation? And trying to actually uh, build a, a metric for people sort of in access to transportation that then might potentially feed um, a, a, an improved system. But I think there's no substitute f at some point for making sure that you survey the population using tried and true probability methods. And, and then the, the trick is our survey dollars need to be, to be carefully allocated. Um, and then because so much of the rest is, is you know, data is close to free. So let me take a shot also at your question, Henry. I think uh, this is not a new problem, right? So in my field, lost sale is a, is a problem that we have been facing for a long time. So you don't, if somebody goes to a supermarket and the product is not on the shelf, uh, that person is not going to buy it. So you have to make sure that your inventory is actually at the level at which people, you know, you don't lose sales. But how do you do that? How do you find that out? And so I think we have the same issue here. And so one of the things that we can do is what Carol is saying, go back, go back to the field and do service. I think we have also another opportunity you now because this, these you know, telecommunication devices are not that expensive, at least the one that would have the bare minimal capabilities for actually enabling some, some of these systems. So we could do experiments in neighborhoods and seeing the difference that it makes. And I think you know, there are a lot of playgrounds in Michigan where we could do things like this. And we could see what is the effect and measure the effect. I, I'm a strong believer in intervention because once you do interventions, you really have, you know, you, you really have people, uh, you, you see adoption, you see how people react to new technologies, how people react to the new service. So I think that's, that's something that we can do. It requires funding, uh, but this is something that we can definitely do. Good. I think with that, we will um, uh, thank all of the panelists. Uh, for their, uh, uh, their, their discussion and their great uh, presentations. Um, so thank you. Nine, when we were expecting a lot of nurses to retire and they didn't because of the economy. But now we are losing nurses faster than we are able to bring them into the workforce. Part of the reason for that is a faculty.